Welcome to the Tin Dog Podcast. Yet another episode of me rambling insanely about the best show in the universe. Before I start, and this show will be primarily dealing with the latest boxed set called Beneath the Surface, I've just got a couple of points. I'd like to thank everyone who's been leaving feedback on iTunes, and I'd especially like to thank the person who gave me two stars out of five. Hello, hello wherever you are. You see, I actually think you've got quite a good point. Perhaps I should just be dealing with the classic series. I should only be reviewing a series that I know and love, rather than reviewing new Doctor Who. Now I know that the remarkably good Staggering Stories podcast does deal with various reviews of the classic series, and indeed Podshock goes back and does that. But I think I could be an argument made for me just dealing with the classic serial. Mainly because I don't want my disaffection with the new series to in any way infect any of the areas of fandom. I know we can all think for ourselves, but what I say here is permanent. And I don't feel good about saying bad things about something I know a lot of people have worked extremely hard on, if you see what I mean. I would also like to take this opportunity of thanking everyone who's been emailing me as to whether Tobias Lumick, the Torchwood correspondent, should return when Torchwood returns to our screens next week. Are you excited for Torchwood? Oddly, I actually am. You see, when Star Trek returned to us with the next generation, and I like to think of the new Doctor Who as our version of Star Trek The Next Generation, the first season was, admittedly, a little bit ropey. But it learned. It learned from its mistakes and it grew. And it became absolutely fantastic by season three. So, I'm going to give Torchwood another go. I'm hoping that it is exactly what we were promised, or indeed what we hoped for. Oh God, perhaps it's even more than we hoped for. So, let's look at the votes. Well, on our swingometer, we have three votes for Device Lumic and four votes for me to review Torchwood. Oh, it's neck and neck. So remember, email your thoughts at tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. And so, onwards to the review of the Beneath the Surface box set. A lot of people have emailed me and asked me what an ideal starting point for getting into Classic Who would be. And again, a lot of people suggest an unearthly child, the New Beginnings, no, not the New Beginnings box set, the Beginnings box set. And it is a good place to start if you want to experience Black and White Who. But if you want to experience a development or an arc of Doctor Who, this new box set is ideal. It consists of three stories. The first being what's known to a lot of people as the Silurians, and more of that later. The Sea Devils, again, more of that later. And finally, the much maligned, but remarkably enjoyable, Warriors of the Deep. Now, what links these three stories, two John Pertwee stories and one Peter Davidson, it seems like an odd combination, until you look at who's actually the villains. In the first story, the Silurians, a race of creatures who've hidden underneath the earth, in order to emerge once a natural catastrophe is gone, only to discover that these Johnny-come-lately apes have gone and evolved into the human race, and they want their land back. Similarly, the Sea Devils is almost the same story. Again, the Sea Devils and the Silurians are meant to be cousins, and this is illustrated best in the final story in the box set, Warriors of the Deep, where you get to see the Sea Devils and the Silurians working together. 
Whether they should work together, well, we'll get back to you on that one. I think we should deal with this one at a time. It's a four disc set. The first two discs dealing with the seven part story, Doctor Who and the Silurians. It's actually called Doctor Who and the Silurians. Now, for a start, most fans of a certain age will say, but the show is called Doctor Who, not the character. He's called the Doctor. Now, there's ongoing arguments about this. There's examples of the Doctor being called the Doctor or Doctor Who at various and not always comical points in the script. For what seemed like hundreds of years, but to be honest was about 18, the character at the end of the show was actually called Doctor Who. So an argument could be made for the show and the character being called Doctor Who. Why would John Pertwee's Doctor have the number plate Who Won on his car if his surname wasn't Doctor Who? But I don't believe that it is. As a child I used to believe that Who was in fact the first bit of his surname, but that was a child's view of Doctor Who. In many respects, I guess, that's the real view of Doctor Who. A child's view can only be that. So, the story is called, on screen, Doctor Who and the Silurians. Now, if there were a race of creatures from what we call the Silurian era, they would be nothing more than evolved fish. Now, obviously, some people who are not into the theory of evolution... Now, I'm using the word theory to mean what's generally accepted as fact probably would have even more issues but then again they usually have issues with science fiction have I gone all theological on people? I'm sorry for that let's get back to the review shall we? you can probably tell that there's a slight difference in sound quality in this story I'm actually trying out a new mic and a new recording system I'm going straight into Audacity via my new Asus EEE701 laptop I'm still running um, the original Linux uh, platform. I'm very happy with it, apart from the fact that I have no idea at all how to upgrade OpenOffice or even get the spell check to work. You can run XP on this, but to be honest, if I can get Audacity to run nicely so that I can do my podcasts on it, I'll be a happy camper. I really have digressed. If you're playing the drinking game, knock one back now. So, continuing on, the Silurians. Story one in the box set. It's the second John Pertwee story. John's found his feet. It's a seven it's a seven episode story. Now that is a lot of episodes for the sort of audience that experiences something at such breakneck speed as the new series. But it's a nice thing to have on and just let it sort of wash over you. The plot doesn't drag as much as some writers would have you believe. I for one find it quite quite good. As with many Doctor Who stories, the original colour print for this was lost. Now, in 1993, a Betamax recording from America was combined with a black and white film version um, using some sort of electronic gubbins, and they released it on VHS. The VHS became quite well sought after and a bit of a collector's piece. I, for one, couldn't find it for a long time. And on this box set, there's a documentary, a very short one, that shows you how they've gone back to basics and gone back to the original film version and the original beta version, combined the two, so that would be an NTSC signal rather than the PAL signal, combined them both, used vidfire to bring up the film quality, um, moved the focus from the centre, um, and done all sorts of electronic gubbins in order to give us for what me is one of the nicely res nicest restored stories going. If they do this with the demons, I will be very, very happy. Another reason that this is a really good starting point is that all of these stories are Earth-based. Admittedly, the first one on land, second one on sea, third one under the sea, but they are all Earth-based, so it's not too much of a shock to the system for new Doctor Who fans who, let's face it, aren't used to leaving Earth at all. As with all of these box sets, it's worth mentioning that you may already have the stories taped off UK Gold or Drama or still have them on VHS, so why should you buy them on DVD apart from the fact that the quality is now so much better? Well, for me, 
it's the documentaries. These documentaries are by some people's standards just watched once or twice while passing, but I for one will be watching at least one of these documentaries, the What Lies Beneath documentary on the Silurians disc, more than once, because it is one of the best Doctor Who documentaries I have ever seen. It compares all Doctor Who and new Doctor Who and the de development of the stories in the 1970s, showing what the world was like to Doctor Who fans at the time. It's narrated by Geoffrey Palmer, who was the captain on board this year's Christmas special, and of course is actually in this story, looking considerably younger. Again, it's followed by another documentary called Going Underground, which is a making of. Again, this is a very good story. It's the first colour story to use CSO, I believe. I'm not sure whether they used colour separation overlay in the first story. CSO, or blue screen, or indeed green screen as it later became, is such an important part of 1970s Doctor Who, and of course the development of science fiction in general, that it's well worth experiencing the making of. Of course there's another then and now visit into the locations documentary and finally, no, there are five documentaries on this, these discs rather than four. The fourth one is the aforementioned colour Silurian overlay which is the one that shows you how to recreate the colour prints and the fifth one is a short documentary all about the 1970s music used. Now the music was, uh, how can I put this nicely, experimental to say the least. Not a bad thing, just a true thing. Electronic farty noises is how one of my friends puts it. The electronic farty noises are found mostly in the Sea Devils, the Sea Devils being the second story in this three-story set. The Sea Devils takes place considerably later in John Pertwee's Time as the Doctor. He seems much happier, much more at ease in the role. This story also contains the Master, and it also contains one of the classic master moments that's referenced later on in the new series, I believe in Last of the Time Lords, when in Last of the Time Lords the master is watching the uh, Teletubbies on his laptop. In this story, on what looks like a TV but could be a monitor, he's watching a episode of the kids series The Clangers. Uh, it's lovely, it's postmodern, it's nice to referential, it's not too referential, and it apparently looks like the doctor's, sorry, the master's being extremely earnest when he says these races are fascinating and he tries to whistle and communicate with the clangers or learn their language. Now, the master, without wanting to give away too many spoilers, was captured at the end of one of the other stories from the previous season. Delgado is trapped on this little island and apparently has access to some Time Lord information which gave rise to knowledge of a race of creatures called the Sea Devils. Now, they, do, they never at this point refer to themselves as the Sea Devils, in a similar way to the Silurians never calling themselves the Silurians. In this story, the Doctor actually tries to correct the Silurians' name to Eocenes, which again could be perceived as something a bit dodgy. The Eocene box set I can't see being something we'd all rush out and buy. The Sea Devils is what the locals call the water-based lizards that seem to be dressed in this year's height of fashion being fishnets. The Sea Devils is a six-part story. Again, it does feel slightly long, but that was the nature of Doctor Who in those days. It's nice to have on in the background, and it's nice also to see the Doctor and the Master combining forces, and then not combining forces, and there's a sword fight at one point. All very iconic moments. Classic Pertwee. Both of these stories are extremely good Pertwee. I'd rather not discuss the ending of these two stories, but let's face it, we are in charge of the planet Earth. The Sea Devils and the Silurians aren't, so you can probably guess for yourself what happens. The third story, to round all this off, is Warriors of the Deep. In 1984, I remember watching this. I was 12, and it was a very good story. I was actually quite pleased at some of the... Um, choices that the production company had made. Rather than making a sea base that was all dark and moody and scary, it had gone brightly lit and I thought, yes, that is what sea bases would be like, because if you were underground all the time you'd need something bright to keep your mind active. As opposed to the truth which you find out on watching the making of documentary when you find out, rather sadly, 
that the choice for lighting it like this was frowned upon by almost everyone and was only selected at the last moment in order to get the show actually made. The 80s have a lot to answer for and for many Doctor Who fans Warriors of the Deep marks a point where everybody comes together to go I don't really like that story. I think they're wrong. Admittedly it has its flaws but then again and I have said then again again isn't all Doctor Who flawed? But we still love it. A point early on where the Doctor turns to his companion, the very nice Tegan, and says, Oh look, here's some gas. What does kill? Lizards and sea life. Looks almost directly at the camera with a wink and goes, Remember that for later. That'll be really important. And in saying that, you've now kind of worked out how it all ends. And the answer is badly. The reason that many Doctor Who fans also don't like this story is because of a monster called the Mirka, or the Mica. Either way, it's a bit of a pantomime horse of a monster. Most Doctor Who monsters were people in costumes. It's never been a huge issue with me, and I'd rather watch a man in a rubber suit than watch CGI almost any day. Although I do have a small point, a small love of puppets. Did that just make me sound extremely odd? Men in rubber suits and puppets I prefer. Hmm, that's going to be taken out of context, I'm aware of that. Warriors of the Deep takes place in the distant future of 2084, where two superpowers are enacting some sort of Cold War very similar to 1984. We all know what's happening. Science fiction's got its little, you know, parallels with reality head on, and you're nodding politely and going, of course you have, that's great. We don't mind, we've got no problems with that. And so, there are missile runs, there are silos, there are people threatening each other with warheads. There's all that sort of thing going on. There's, there's spies. There's everything. Not a problem. Very well, very, very well acted. Quite well executed. And of course it has some very, 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 very good model work. I love model work. Uh, on the subject of which, there is an easter egg on this disc. And it's one of my all-time favourites. A personal hero of mine is Matt Irvine, who was one of the model makers well, on Doctor Who and a lot of other shows like Tripods and many other things. I've, I've met him twice at conventions and um, he's the guy who often brings K9 along to the conventions. He actually operated K9 in the Aquarius Folk Special and at the end of School Reunion. The Easter egg is found, I think, on the special features and then you go left with the remote. And it's a short f short called Matt's Models. Well worth a look. Suggest you dig it out. It just kind of talks you through. There's also another sh short on this disc. Uh, one of the documentaries. It's a section from a series called Science in Action. Which interviews a considerably younger Matt Irvine. Talking about the nature of plastics. Now one of my courses that I've done was an HND in prop building. And if I'd seen this uh, short description of how plastics works. I'm sure I would have done slightly better on the course than I did. The documentary that comes with The Warriors of the Deep is called Into the Depths, and one of the quotes at the beginning was, if ever you needed to know how not to make Doctor Who, this was it. And as soon as you hear that, you know you're in for a good documentary. It covers everything. It covers the way that the Merca didn't turn up until the day of filming, and that very few people could walk in it. It pub covers the Thatcher... Um, election that year, the way that everything was brought forward, the way that things didn't fit together, the struggles in continuity, and of course if ever fans of a certain Tacky on TV podcast may wonder what Ian Levine looks like, you can see him in all living colour in this documentary as well. So to sum up, is this a good box set? Without question. Go out and buy it now, because this is a very, very good introduction to some great stories. The moral questions raised in these stories are illustrations of a gentler time, but also a time that I think influenced a lot more people than we give them credit for. This is John Pertwee at his best. And if you need to see these stories again, see them again now. I'm going to play out in a moment with a track called The Who Rhythmics. It's from Who Mix, which is a lovely website dedicated to different people giving different attempts at the theme tune. I really suggest it visiting it, although I will try and put a new one on the end of each show. This one's by someone who posts as Jex, although you will be able to find him 
on the Outpost Gallifrey forums. If you'd like to contact him, please send your emails to me and I will forward them to him. have been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Doctor Who and its associated shows are all trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Contact us at tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk.